Good afternoon and good evening. Good evening and welcome. You're listening to Heart of Mind Radio over the Progressive Radio Network, PRN.FM. I'm Katherine Davis, and on today's program, we're going to be speaking with Alan Steinfeld, host of New Realities television program, and we're going to be talking about the prospect of human interaction with extraterrestrial races. And as part of today's program, we're going to be sharing an excerpt from a New Realities broadcast that features J.J. Hertak, Ph.D., in which he introduces historical and ancient evidence that ETs have been and are already present on the earth. Before formally introducing my guest, I just want to say hello and welcome Alan Steinfeld. Hi, Kathy. Hi, good to be here. Thank you. Uh, Yes, and thank you for joining us. For the last 20 years, Alan Steinfeld has traveled the globe looking for the most important contribution to the field of consciousness. And as I mentioned, he's the host and producer of the New Realities television show, which is on Time Warner Television in New York City. He has produced over 2,000 interview programs with leading-edge thinkers, scientists, artists, paradigm shifters, and religious leaders from around the world. His website is newrealities.com. In addition to producing this program, Alan is a writer, producer, director, photographer, and acupuncturist. He's the author of the book, Careers in Alternative Medicine, and he is, is the director of the narrative film, Never Wear a Dead Man's Shoes, which is about modern Jewish superstitions. And he has produced documentaries in India on spiritual leaders, in Egypt on ancient temples along the Nile, in Santa Fe on the healing arts, and in Los Angeles on dolphin intelligence. And he's also co-authored the play Quintessent, a multimedia extravaganza that merges the worlds of science, spirituality, and art. Well, Alan, you certainly have a full career with multifaceted talents. (laughs) I'm so happy to have you join me today. It's always good to talk to you, Catherine. I I, I appreciate you you being a voice of... um, of alternative awareness, and this is what we need. We need media that talks about these other ideas that are not just political alternatives, but um, spiritual ideological alternatives. Yeah, and I really think that this is, you know, the work for us, all of us who are who are in this field, who are called to it. Some refer to this work as being a light worker. Um, I think it's more of being a, a cosmopolitan, a true cosmopolitan, that coming to the realization that we are cosmic citizens. And I think that would be a good place to start today. Um, in about 12 minutes, we're going to be playing an excerpt from one of your programs with Dr. J.J. Hertak, and he um, is going to be speaking about some of the fundamentals of um, understanding ET presence on the Earth and from the perspective that it's been going on for since ancient times, even beyond historical to ancient civilizations have had contact with ETs. But um, I have a tendency to re- refer to these beings as star beings as, mm-hmm. at this point because they feel very close and feel a lot more like family than um, some kind of strange presence. So I'm wondering if we could start out by you sharing with us your perspective on the ET presence in humanity's life. Mm, Thank you. Well, it is something that I've been fascinated with since I was a child. I mean, I would look at the stars and 
And it's like, you know, you see houses in the distance. Those are lights on at night. You see these little light. Well, you see these lights in the sky. Those are people's homes in the distance. It, it, it wasn't a, a huge um, leap to think that, well, these are, these are some lights on other worlds where other beings are living. I don't think, never thought that was a... a, a fantasy. I thought that was a probability. I would always look at the stars and, and, and wonder about them. And no one else seemed to be so interested in it. I said, look, I mean, I would just, I would just remember as a child being fascinated by these lights in the sky and um, feeling that there had to be other things out there. But then we get um, indoctrinated with our culture, with our media, with our education, even our religion, that, that kind of um, singles us out. I mean, especially when you look at um, scientific dogma. I mean, a lot of science is, of course, right, and um, but some of it's dogmatic, and some of it is based on um, ideas that are, are, don't have any facts. Like, uh, I would say... Uh, Darwinian evolution, for instance. Darwinian evolution says that life is an accident, it, uh, it occurred, it evolves through a chance mutation. Well, of course there's evolution. I'm not denying that, but is it based on chance mutation? Is life just an accident? And I came across a really amazing statistic recently where the scientist, um, I forgot what university is, what university, but is doctor, I can find out. But he said that DNA is estimated to be 9 billion years old because of the complexity of that molecular structure, and the Earth itself is only 4 billion years old. So it seems like DNA and everything that supports life is older than the Earth itself. And this goes along with what I believe is that there was... Um, uh, life was brought here from other worlds where it may have developed, and, you know, Earth was quite a beautiful place to plant that seed of life, and um, uh, it came here, especially intelligent life. So I think, uh, I think we are part of a, of a cosmic uh, system of life. Yes, I think star beings is a better name to call these extraterrestrial or alien beings, because when you picture aliens, you think of something very foreign to who we are, and I think we're a lot more like um, these beings that are come, have come, and will continue to be here in greater numbers as people open up to the idea that we're not alone. I mean, just to place that in a reference, Arthur C. Clarke said, there's two possibilities. Either we're all alone in the universe or that the universe contains other life, and both, both possibilities are awesome. Well, I think that the universe does contain other life. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that we, as uh, conscious, intelligent beings, are just an accident of creation. So um, are they making contact? Have they been here? Well, if you look at the historical record, if you look just just a little bit below the surface, uh, you see all over the Internet there are documents proving that we've had contact, including documents from the CIA and the FBI. There's one document called the um, Guy Huddle Memo to J. Edgar Hoover from 1950 claiming that the um, there were three crashed um, UFO crafts in New Mexico that were brought to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and there were nine bodies found among those crafts. So this is in the FBI records. Actually, the FBI was complaining because that was the most looked-at file in their whole website. <laughs> they, they were saying, why aren't they looking at all the, the crimes we solved? No, people are interested in this. They're interested in our connection to something bigger, and it also gives us a an understanding that we are one planet, that we are humanity, that we're not separated into races, religion, nationalities. Those are fabrications. Those are, those are false identifications where we really are a collective humanity. So I think it, 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 it puts on a great hope in us coming together as a uh, cohesive planet as we um, 
start to meet the other ones publicly. Does, does that explain some of it? Yes, it really does, and it very much um, resonates with my perspective. I actually believe that the human race is a seated race in, in that, of course, our bodies and our structure and our the elements of our body come from the substance of the earth, but I believe that over different periods of time that we have been seated, um, upgraded mm-hmm. might be a word, by uh, more advanced civilizations, and I would say I equally believe that perhaps some um, regressive civilizations have been here as well and have created problems for humanity that we're still actually trying to work out um, in this whole evolutionary process. So I'm really, like you, quite convinced that the, just the odds that this would be the only planet in this massive universe, galaxy after galaxy after galaxy, to me is an unreasonable um, concept. Mm. It just doesn't make any it just doesn't make any sense. If you just looked at the law of averages, it wouldn't make any sense. And so from my perspective, yes. And, you know, I've actually seen what I have perceived to be craft moving in the sky and um, mm. So I, I, you know, I've had some rather um, interesting interactions, though I wouldn't say that they were third-dimensional physical interactions, more um, esoteric interactions. So I feel quite convinced that the um, star beings are here, and from my perspective, this may, though it may not have been true throughout all of history, the beings that are here now are quite positive, service to others kind of beings. And Mm -hmm. I believe the reason that we haven't seen them is because they're not allowed to interfere with free will and what the general consensus is on the planet. Otherwise, we might have had a a closer interaction at this point. Well, you know, I do agree with you that we are a seated race. I like how refer to that and I think that um, we we humans were interbred with the um, evolving primates here so I think that who we are is a combination of um, of earth uh, creatures that evolved through a, a kind of let's call it natural selection although that's not really a good word and star beings that came here who saw these evol- the potential of these evolving primates and seeded them with a higher intelligence, with a more, uh, let's say, prolific DNA that, that connected them. So we are, I think, a, a, a race of humans that are part animal and part gods, as, as, we, as we can recall, refer to that. Not that these were gods in themselves, but they had some pretty amazing capabilities and that's what the legends this is what the whole ancient astronaut idea and Eric von Donegan who will be at this conference that's coming up we could talk about that but the whole idea that um, uh, that these ancient gods that we worship were really star people that were were more evolved in the, and and the part of our and that what we received with is to become more godlike to to take the on those powers of um, of perception and abilities that have been blocked by our animal nature, you know. So we're in a struggle between our animal nature and our, and let's say, our godlike nature, and that's like that. That's something that all religions can agree upon. That and most humanity. But where do we get this from? Not from the animals, but for something higher. It's also the the book by Zachariah Sitch in the 12th planet who talk about that race of Anunnaki who came here, who did the seeding about 250,000 years ago was when the sort of last modification of our humanness or our evolvingness, uh, evolved nature came into being. And that's where things like the, the cave paintings, that's, where, that's what sparked our creative capacities, which animals don't really have the way humans do. They don't have the ability to be these creative, um, expressive 
creatures, and um, I think that's part of our our higher nature. So. Exactly. Um, I want to um, go into um, this piece with um, J.J. Hertog. So I know that you've been interviewing him. This is actually one of the earlier interviews that you did, but I like it because it really sets the foundation to help people understand um, how this has played out in history uh, from mm-hmm. his perspective and from his research. So maybe just give a brief preview of the event that um, J.J. Hertog and Desiree Hertog will be at, and then I'd like to go into the interview itself. And me too. I'll be hosting, along with, uh, let's say there's probably another 30 speakers, uh, a conference in California next week, May, let's see, it's May 19th to the 22nd, 2017, an event called Contact in the Desert. This is in Joshua Tree, California. It, it's a gathering of three or 4,000 people whose understanding of this ET realities is not foreign. It's not something that's rejected. It's something that's embraced. Lots of people at this conference have had contact or claim to have contact either psychically or physically, and we'll get into the difference between that. Um, There's a movement towards disclosure, which is another key word in the UFO uh, understanding uh, disclosure means the government coming forward and releasing the secrets that they have publicly. So this gathering uh, will include lots of researchers that people have seen, Linda Moulton Howe, Richard Dolan, and including uh, J.J. Hurtock and Desiree Hurtock. I'll be there. And it's a conference really for people to compare notes. It's been called the Woodstock of UFOlogy. There was just an article in USA Today about this conference. So it's if you believe in this, if you're open to this, if you suspect the possibilities that there might be life and there might be we might be visited, this is the conference to go to contact in the desert dot com. And JJ Hurtock is someone I've been interviewing for the last twenty years. We have a series of uh, videos on my YouTube channel, and people can also get that. Well, through you, we'll be talking about that. But J.J. Hurtock himself had many experiences with contact with other beings, uh, higher dimensional beings, what he calls ultra-terrestrials, and also physical beings, because he's... um, he sort of activated himself. He's activated a higher intelligence within his own uh, awareness through meditation, through um, having a higher consciousness experience where beings have come to him. So some people who are activated have easier um, connections to these higher realms. And there's more and more people waking up. So he started an organization called the Academy for Future Science, which involves um, uh scientific investigations of uh, of these uh, possible ET connections, as well as understanding of ancient civilizations. He's just, him and his wife had just written a book about um, the, uh, the possibility that the ancient Egyptians had electrical, electric lights, because you don't see any of the, the markings of torches on their ancient tombs. Obviously, there was some kind of inner illumination that didn't, didn't, um, smoke up the ceilings and what was that and there's evidence actually if you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art you see these electrical uh, kind of hieroglyphs on the side of the Temple of Dendora there so anyway J.J. Hurtux has investigated many many aspects of ancient civilization and modern technology and ET contact so I just find those conversations very fascinating so I decided to do a series of videos with him for my YouTube channel and my program on Manhattan Cable. So this is one of them. Right. I think, we, and this one's called. I think we call this ET Realities. Okay, so let's go to our interview. Well, your interview on new yeah. realities um, on this um, contact that that um, JJ Hertog is able to talk to us about. Okay. 
Welcome to New Realities. My name is Alan Steinfeld, and on this show, I like to explore consciousness, the realms of consciousness, and how we are changing as a race on the planet, and how we're expanding our perspectives of who we are. So on tonight's show, I have a very special guest who's been a scientist for the last 30 years investigating the realms of ET consciousness, extraterrestrial consciousness. He's a historian, writer, linguist, scientist, and he's here to talk to us about the historic and futuristic understandings of what we are about to enter into as a planetary galactic race. The, tonight's guest is Dr. J.J. Hertog. Thank you, Alan. Give us a little background of your history and involvement in the area of consciousness and especially extraterrestrial consciousness. Most people know me as a writer, a philosopher in the futuristic area. Mm -hmm. I also was trained in uh, geology, archaeology, and I have been working in what we call remote sensing technology, which unlike remote viewing, mm -hmm. where you use the paranormal powers of the mind to look at distant objects, uh -huh. uh, remote sensing technology uses airborne and spaceborne technology such as lasers, infrared systems to look down at specific targets on the earth or distant targets mm. and compose information that leads to a great in-depth understanding of what is hidden there under the surface of the earth. Uh -huh. And so having the background both in the technical side as well as the philosophical side, I was very much interested in extraterrestrial realities. In the early 70s, my wife and I actually saw several spacecraft while I was teaching at one of the state universities in California. This led to the documentation of information which I share with some of my colleagues at NASA and also one of the great members of the uh, American Admiralty, the late Elmer mm. Bill Farney. And I had the opportunity to uh, learn very much, very, very quickly, that we as a human race in the 20th century were being watched and we were interacting with a wide variety of cosmic cultures. What was your background, though? Where, what were you teaching? What kind of subjects? What were you... Well, by background, I was trained in uh, social science, linguistics, mm -hmm. at the University of Chicago with uh, Dr. Mircea Eliade, mm -hmm. who wrote uh, several books and introduced me to the Sanskrit literature of India. Mm -hmm. The ancient sutras, their special texts of India, speak of contact tens of thousands of years before our Judeo-Christian tradition in the West. What did you discover in the ancient Vedic texts that was related to this idea of extraterrestrial and our consciousness? It was basically the theme of the Vimana, or the, the sacred vehicle, that connected the humanity of this world with the other worlds. And it was the realization that there was a higher cosmology than the three-dimensional model of heaven, earth, and the underworld that we normally think about in terms of our scientific paradigms of the West is coming from the spiritual frontiers of the East mm -hmm. and the Near East. And so this led to my work with um, Chinese uh, oracle bones or text, mm -hmm. and I had the opportunity to publish with uh, a noted Orientalist back in the late 60s a remarkable Chinese oracle bone. And so this is what I call a proto-copy for the Carl Sagan message that was set up with Pioneer 10 back in the, the 70s. This uh, is approximately 1350 BC, and I had it uh, published and linguistically analyzed by my colleagues at the University of Hong Kong, who agreed with it that this was an exceptional bit of data, suggesting should sacrifice be made to these godlike auspicious forms from space. Wow. The answer was it wasn't necessary, but the fact that the oracle bones uh -huh. preserve even an earlier tradition that go back some 30,000 years suggest that the very foundations of Eastern and Western cosmology and philosophy yeah. are basically atomistic. They accept the reality that there are many worlds, many reality structures, and we are but just one civilization on the tree of life, which abounds with many. So the ancients knew this. They came in with this knowledge. How do you explain that? How do you explain primitive man, supposedly according to our historian, knowing so much? 
if we take the documents at face value, mm -hmm. even with the inner nuances of some interpretive power, it is clear that many of the sages, the, the prophets, the seers, even in our own Western uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, claimed actual contact with the higher worlds of experience. Mm. And although the language structure will vary, in the Hebrew we use the concept of the Merkava, uh -huh. the vehicle of contact, nonetheless the concept of the chariot, the concept of the vehicle, mm. regardless of the language we use, suggests that these were very powerful events and that these writers yeah. and thinkers, priest historians and scientists or Kabbalists yeah. were actually writing and speaking as journalists who were there, who had the experience right. that they could document in a variety of ways. And this was the, the seed form that I feel laid the foundations for speculative thought in a direction of a multidimensional universe. So were these ancient people um, actually functioning with a greater capacity of their knowing, of their consciousness, than we are today, because they were aware of this? I think one could argue that a select number of people who were behind the great hydraulic societies of Central Asia, mm. and certainly those that we have found recently in uh, Bolivia, at a height of some twelve to 14,000 feet above sea level, knew something about civil engineering, hydraulics, mathematics, temple building, and they obviously were recipients mm. of information either from a much earlier strata of human history, that is to say the impetus for our intellectual evolution gets off the ground much earlier than we give thought or reflection on. Mm. At the same time, it could very well be if we take the scenarios literally that there were some events some extrasolar influences which allowed, quote-unquote, the programmers or the gods or the architects to update the human race. What kind of events and what kind of evidence do we have of these events that may have taken place for the, that kind of interaction with what you call the gods? The very fact that we have such unique mappings, mm. very specific star mapping codes, that are connected with the hydraulic societies of the East and what we have discovered recently in South America in areas that are very, very remote suggest mm -hmm. that there was some type mm -hmm. of radical change that occurred. I believe, as we are now experiencing, with the possibility of extraterrestrial contact, mm -hmm. that there was an earlier cycle of this extraterrestrial contact, or as Mir Chiliadi would say, this is the myth of the eternal return. Those mm. that lay the seeds of the human experiment periodically come back to update and to share and to inspire the human recipients. Huh. We find the same in the Sanskrit texts that speak of the Tathagatas, of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, these very oh. magnificent beings that come from the higher worlds of intelligence, bringing forth the knowledge of creation to the human race, as so well as in the Vimana story, the spacecraft that we normally, in the conventional sense, identify with the extraterrestrial events. The Chinese oracle bones form the oldest unbreakable link in terms of the intellectual heritage of the East and show that the Eastern philosophers and scientists, unlike those in the West, did not accept the reality of a three-story universe of heaven, earth, and the underworld. They simply acknowledged, later as the Kabbalist would in the ancient Near East, that there were many worlds, mm. or as the Greek atomistic philosophers, that there were multiple universes and we were just one of many systems. And so this greater cosmology brought my attention to specific footprints of information, and I decided very early, having the opportunity to travel and work in other cultures, mm. to make use of my linguistic ability as well as my background remote sensing, to put the two together and see if we could find out a message behind all of the folk myths and the mythology of contact. And what did you find? What is the message that's coming? The message is that we've never been alone. We've always been subjects of curiosity by extrasolar forms of civilization intelligence. Our spiritual traditions, mm. I believe, come from these early events of cosmic contact, mm. or what the Greek philosophers would call panspermia, 
the seed forms of intelligence that were brought through galactic clouds or through direct association with universal space-borne intelligence. And we as a human race, ironically, at the end of the 20th century are now waking up and recognizing that perhaps there is some truth to what the ancient Chinese, the East Africans, the ancient Hebrew prophets are speaking about in the wheel within the wheel. Now, however, we can take a closer look and realize it's not all myth. There is a kernel of science that is there. How is that being played out? Um, I think we see this in the, the Native American shamans and speakers coming to the fore, mm. suggesting that we're on the brink of a major consciousness shift. Mm -hmm. For me, it's been work with the Zulus in Africa where I was able to do a film documentary some 15 years ago with Credo Mutwa, who has become very renowned through John Mack and others, yeah. and Credo and other Zulu historians spoke about the contact experiences of their people going back thousands of years, mm -hmm. even before the arrival of so-called European missionaries. Mm -hmm. The Africans were very well connected with the other realms of intelligence. In fact, the Zulus have a wonderful mythology, cosmology that speaks of a civilization on our sister planet, Mars. Uh -huh. And during some disaster that took place, the most beautiful women were placed in a vehicle called the Maracaiba and brought to this world. Uh -huh. They claim their, their people thus were seated or brought in from a different evolutionary realm. Now that word, Merikaiba, is very yeah. close to the Hebrew word, Merkava, which we just mentioned, yeah. for divine vehicle. So this is all suggesting mm. that there was a parent civilization that influenced the great cultures of East Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, and the Far East, mm -hmm. possibly tens of thousands of years before, that may have had some type of extrasolar event, some impact mm. that was strong enough to move people into the direction of temple building, mm. star gazing, if you will, and the development of uh, mathematical texts, sutra materials, oracle bones materials that were identifying specific regions of space. So something impacted on the earth and its so-called maybe primitive civilization that upgraded it to a level of divinity, let's say. Quasi-divinity in the sense that the human parent, mm -hmm. whether we use the archetypal Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. or whether we use the concept of the, the Earth Mother, mm -hmm. the, the Indian concept in Central America, Tonansi, mm -hmm. brings forth a change and the archetypal parent or parents appear on the scene. Mm -hmm. Where did we lose this um, kernel of sacred knowledge? How did we get lost? I feel it was probably in the separation of the spiritual sciences and the, the physical sciences in the Western European tradition. Mm. Some 400 years ago when the Provence of consciousness became the domain of introspection that was left primarily for the theologians. Uh -huh. And science, through the scientific method, began to entertain simply the physical reality and that split, that psyche, mm. Mm. that inner consciousness split was, uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the, the triggering mechanism to push as it were the, the paradigms. And we're coming to a point now where the totality of consciousness is being put back together. We're recognizing we're just as much as in space as space is within us. Mm -hmm. We're recognizing that the great unconsciousness that Jung speaks about is before birth, during life, and even that which is after death in the Tibetan sense of the Bardo experience must be answered and can, in some sense, be addressed if we recognize that we are just but one of many mm. civilizations and that evolution doesn't stop with the human planetary society. Mm, that's, that's beautiful. So as we move into this new consciousness that's coming, because there is, is a spiritual, what I call, revolution happening in the West, we are discovering these ancient documents that then directly relate to our uh, greater uh, participation in our galactic society. We are living at the age of a remarkable breakthrough, a whole flotilla, a whole avalanche of documents are being uncovered in the Gobi Desert, in Syria with the Ebla text, in Egypt with the work at Giza, more recently with the work in Bolivia at Tiwanaku, some 
12 to 14,000 feet above sea level, we have found archaeological evidences of certain aspects of hydraulic engineering mm. unknown until recent times, suggesting that the ancients who were there in these mountain retreats knew how to bring water at great distances, knew how to keep open water beds at night to control the temperature values of the land, mm -hmm. knew how to create an ecological niche for survival, and knew specifically that certain temples on Earth, in the mountains or in the deserts, were geological and archaeological maps mm. of where the human race was influenced or received knowledge from. And in some twinkling of an eye, the ancient documents are telling us, as well as the legends of the native shamans and thinkers, that some direction of renewal will help us link up once again with our counterparts in space, what I call our cosmic cousins. Or we can turn our backs on all of this, consider it simply the byproduct of the Hollywood writers, mm -hmm. and shall we say not take advantage of the great crossroads of space and time so, that are changing. Yeah, so let's, what can we do? Well, I can simply say for the record, having worked with the former member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and having looked at more than 92,000 computer documents from all over the world, Kathy? showing that we're not only being touched by extraterrestrial, but ultra-terrestrial civilization, that is to say, even We're beyond alive, the, the metallurgical, oh, okay. no, three-dimensional okay, stage of evolution, that we, as a human race, are going to fulfill what is there in the Hopi myths, in the Chinese myths and traditions, and in our own Judeo-Christian tradition, we are going to be able to reach out and make contact with the, the chariot throne, the Merkaba, as it is called by the Hebrew prophets, or the divine vehicle, the Tathagata, as it is referred to in the Eastern tradition, sometime, I believe, in the first part of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. But I think what needs to be done here is a whole new cosmic civics, a whole new recognition that we, as a planetary humanity, mm -hmm. must unite our efforts through programs of education that can present, shall we say, the various categories of the, the cosmic civilizations interacting with the human race. Secondly, we must bring together all of the credible information from the third world countries that have been simply overlooked mm. to fill in the missing pieces in terms of our consciousness and intellectual history, recognizing we need further inputs. Mm. Thirdly, we can invite those people who have formerly worked with the governments of the world to come into the open and suggest that we really need to go into a catch-up very, very quickly if indeed we are involved with some type of cosmic countdown mm. in interacting with these societies. And fourthly, we need to forge a uniqueness between ufology, astronomy, and theology and recognizing that consciousness is a very important part mm. in explaining the paranormal, the paraphysical aspects mm. of the extraterrestrial paradigm, and that within our ability is the seat form of what the Spanish philosophers called the supermente, the supermental ability to reach out and make the cosmic connection, mm. as Michelangelo has shown in the Sistine Chapel with the hand of man reaching to the hand of God. Yeah. In this case, the hands of the Elohim, or the hands of the supreme intelligence, are pluralistic. And we, as a pluralistic humanity, must take advantage, really, of these unique opportunities. Didn't know what time it was, the lights were low, oh, oh. I leaned back on my radio, oh, oh. Some cat was laying down some rock and roll, that a soul said. The loud sound that seemed to fight, fight, fight Came back like a school voice on a wave of fight, fight, fight. That one no DJ, that was Paisy it caused me to There's a starman waiting in the sky He'd like to come and meet us, but he thinks he'd blow our mind
Ellen, yes. Um, Hi. I wanted to comment on this um, interview with um, J.J. Hertog from one of your earlier shows on New Realities. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to comment because um, I feel um, he, uh, Dr. Hertog is a great historian, but it, it's not just about ancient civilizations and contact. I mean, that's very important, but this is a modern phenomena, and it's uh, approaching us at um, not just... Um, Physical appearance, yeah, people are seeing more and more historically. There are more and more sightings all over the world. If you go to the National UFO Reporting Center, you can see that re uh, sightings are up, and that's a place to go if people do see something strange in the sky. But it's also uh, a spiritual and sort of psychic phenomenon where people are feeling they are making contact, where where telepathic communications are awakening in people that are are pretty normal and but they have they're having dreams they're having um intuitions and they're people are getting downloads of new technologies and um people are waking up to the fact that um we are connected through the great receivership of our brain to other beings and so it's that's what a huge um shift is happening i think within the ufo movement it's becoming it's going from hardcore nuts and bolts yeah there are crap to the idea that it's more of a of a spiritual phenomenon i mean all of that's true and um i mean all of that's happening there are uh, there are nuts and bolts um findings of, of ships but it's also like there's a higher dimension involved here and we need to understand consciousness we under, need to understand who we are in terms of consciousness if we're really going to make contact because mm, meeting these beings can be quite um uh upsetting you know meeting people or things or forms that don't look like us that don't think like us we need to expand beyond our limited thinking in order to embrace the other for who they are as sentient beings so uh you know there's also a whole government political um aspect to this idea uh and as well as economic i mean the whole idea of ufos and ets it's a very complex situation and some people say there's uh um, government forces that have been trying to work this through for the last 40 or 50 years. Other people say the government is suppressing this. Other people say that the oil companies don't want this kind of acknowledgement to happen publicly because obviously these uh, beings are not filling up their their UFOs with with oil uh, with gasoline to get here. So right. it's, it's, it's a very very complex issue, and there's the whole religious idea. Uh, are these beings? Are these gods? We don't want to worship these these beings, and there might be the possibility that people will worship them because they are more evolved. But that's not a reason. It's it's we have to reevaluate who we are as human beings. We have to realize we are not the limited. Uh, creatures that we've been told, but we are actually of the cosmos ourselves. I think you mentioned that. We are, consciousness is non-local. The, the CIA proved this with their remote viewing experiments at the Stanford Research Institute, that consciousness is not a local phenomenon. So who we are is really galactic, is really expanded beyond the limited human being we've been conditioned to think we are. You know, I think the whole idea of a couple of years ago, the 2012 um, end of the Mayan calendar, was to show us not that it was the end of the world, but to show us that we, as as a planetary civilization, is connected to the galaxy. This was our our uh, window into a galactic environment. So yes, we have a solar system, and mostly we're taught about the solar system, but we're part of a much, much greater system, the Milky Way, which is also part of the, the local um, galaxy uh, star cluster or galactic cluster, which is part of 
bigger structures. The, they call it the Virgo attractor, which is part of like maybe even a sector of the universe, which is part of a multi-universe, which is something else that J.J. Hurtot gets into. We're part of a multiverse. So we have to expand and take the perspective that mm, – there's a, there's a much greater civilization going on. There's much greater possibilities within the human organism that we have to embrace. And this is what's really exciting about this time uh, on our planet is that we are are much more expanded than we've been told we are. And, and we're awakening to new realities. And this is what's exciting, that there's more to us and there's more possibilities than we've ever uh, suspected before and this is what we have to just um, go into ourselves and trust that there is more to us and we have to believe in ourselves so I think there's there's an exciting future that's awaiting uh, humanity if we just trust who we are and who we believe we are so I um, totally agree I totally you. agree with you because uh, the truth of it is is that you know we hear a lot about this coming to an understanding of being multidimensional. And I agree with you that a lot of this has to do with the level and expansion of consciousness because the real disclosure, such as it is, is going to be first on an intimate one-on-one -on -one, uh, level in terms of um, being able to uh, transmit thoughts and communication from your internal mechanisms, because once we expand beyond our limited consciousness, all of that gray matter, all of that DNA that's not being used will come online, and we'll be able to communicate with beings of these uh, multiple levels uh, of dimension. And I believe that the, the truly um, advanced um, star beings are of a uh, a higher vibrational level and there has to be some matching of that vibration and you have to be able to approach it without fear because they're not going to they're not going to approach you if there's any fear so when like you said when we get to understand exactly what our capabilities are then we can have this gradual integration of understanding consciousness and communication so i think the work that you're doing is really helping us all to prepare for that eventually eventual coming together of the celestial beings and human beings because we are actually graduating to that level of also being celestial and um, the forerunners are the ones who are doing the work that you've been talking about and and the people that are going to be joining you at your event coming up mm -hmm. Um, I, yeah. I know that you mentioned um, a website that people can go to. I don't think I got that website. Could you mention that oh, again? That, it's called contactinthedesert.com. There are still tickets available. It's coming up in two weeks. This is the largest UFO gathering in probably the world. We expect three to 4,000 people there in the desert in Joshua Tree, California, and actually interesting enough, it's near a structure called the Integratron, which was built by a person named George Van Tassel, who said he was visited in the 1940s by ETs, who told him how to build this structure, which would reverse time. And so that structure can be visited. It's called the Integratron. It's right near Joshua Tree, and we're going to take a bunch of people out there as well to to do a meditation in this structure. There's no metal in the structure. This guy, George Mancato, would built it with all wood. And uh, right before he completed it, he died mysteriously, and some of the uh, intricate workings were supposedly confiscated. It's a little controversy, mm -hmm. but it is still a sort of magical structure. It's out near a, a place called Giant Rock, which is a huge boulder in the middle of the desert that doesn't look like anything else, which is, some people said, uh, attracted these beings to come here. But the other thing you're, you're saying is, yeah, we are part of this greater cosmos. We're not separate. And we have to go through this fear into the understanding that there's really nothing to be afraid of because somebody's different. I think we're working out a lot of those problems on Earth. Uh, hopefully we will work through it 
And I do think we've been actually also protected from our own self-destructiveness. There's been evidence of UFOs appearing over nuclear missile silos and shutting off those activation codes. You know, so this this will be talked about at Contact in the Desert. There's also a guy named Michael Sala, uh, who was part of the Air Force, who uh, was there when some of these uh, nuclear warheads were shut down by UFOs that are, appeared overhead. This is also came out in what is called the Citizens' Hearings for UFO Disclosure, which was a five-day um uh, forum in Washington, D.C., in front of former members of Congress, where 40 eyewitness or 40 researchers came forward and talked about the evidence of UFOs within our culture. And they talked about some of these military um, establishments being shut down by uh, UFOs. So um, the evidence is out there. There's some great books, and Richard Dolan, Na- uh, UFOs in a National Security State, where he goes through the historical record and shows where the government is covering up uh, these UFOs. Supposedly, uh, what I was disappointed was that Hillary Clinton wasn't elected, only for the reason that she promised to release the secrets of the UFOs that are now um, classified in the government files. John Podesta, her campaign manager, kept pushing uh, reporters to ask Hillary about the UFO question. There's, um, there's a great exchange on the Jimmy Kimmel show where Hillary is talking about um, the possibilities of releasing those files and that they were no longer calling these objects UFOs, they were calling them UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, because a lot of people in the UFO movement felt that UFOs had sort of a a, a kind of a, a bad uh, stigma attached to them, and they were re they were rebranding them as UAPs. The and this the fact that there's these unidentified aerial phenomena that. Uh, Radar has proven, Air Force has seen, it's everywhere. So if we would relabel them, it might be more accepted by the public because there was a campaign to ridicule the whole idea of UFOs, and that's been very successful on the part of the government, that anyone coming out and speaking about this phenomena would be ridiculed. Um, People like Terrence McKenna have said the, the flying source of the UFO represents perhaps the greatest challenge to science. In other words, the UFO is a defining agent of cultural change. So we need to be aware that there's more to us, more to our planet, more to our DNA, as a matter of fact, than we've been educated to believe. So we have to look in those um, alternative research ideas, which are not false facts. They've just been suppressed. And we have to realize that we are part of a greater cosmos, and that cosmos is waiting for us to wake up. I think they are coming and going in our atmosphere to get us used to the idea. But, you know, why not they land on the White House lawn, the big cliché, is because they know that we are not ready culturally. We're not ready even personally for that embrace. So they're coming and, and going. And, Alan, yes. we're, we're out of time, so let's oh. remind people that this is a really important event coming up, Contact in the Desert, from May 19th to the 22nd in Joshua Tree, California. And you can register by going to contactinthedesert.com. It's a little bit close, but if you're moved and motivated to connect, please do explore this. It's really not expensive when you put it all together for those of you who want to um, get involved. And there are right. people listening to this program who are already out there on the West Coast and may want to get involved. So please check it out. And That's right. It's contactinthedesert.com. If you're the person that thinks you're the only one who believes this kind of stuff and everyone's looking at you as, as crazy, then this is your, your gathering because you're going to meet like-minded people who embrace the idea that more is possible. It's a very exciting movement. It's a social movement. It's a social freedom. It's a, it's a chance for higher truth to come through. That's 
equal to all the other social movements that we've uh, embraced in the last uh, 20 years. So I think, you know. Thanks, Alan. It, yeah, thank we're you, out Kathy. of time. And people can go to prn.fm to Heart of Mind Radio archive page for the information. Bye for now. 